Good evening, everyone. I, Sakib Rahman, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Law, North South University, would like to welcome you all to our webinar today. It would be a privilege from our end to be able to listen to Professor James Gatti, who has very kindly made the time to talk on third world approaches to international law. Before we request Professor Gatti to start, I would like to bring to the notice of the listeners that the chat box is open and that they may address any questions there in the box. The audience is requested to please keep their microphones off. And lastly, I would like to extend my thanks on behalf of the Department of Law to all of you who are present here. Now, regarding our guest speaker, James Gatti is a professor of law and the Wing Tat Lee Chair in International Law at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. He sits on the board of editors of the American Journal of International Law, the Journal of African Law, and the Journal of International Trade Law and Policy, among others. Professor Gatti is an independent expert of the Working Group on Extractive Industries, Environment, and Human Rights Violations in Africa, formed by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. He is also an expert member of the Working Group on Agriculture, Land, Investment, contracts of the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law. He is a founding member of the Third World Approaches to International Law, TWAIL Network. Professor Gatti is an elected member of the International Academy of International Law. He has consulted for the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Economic Commission for Africa, among others. But before we go to Professor Gatti, and before we listen to Professor Gatti, I would like to request Professor Mohamed Rizwan, Rizwan of Islam, Chair of the Department of Law at North South University, for his introductory remarks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Saki, for your introduction to Professor Gatti. Uh, it is my pleasure to have James with us. Uh, despite claims by many that international law is universal, international law is truly international. There would be some who would question that to what extent international law is really international. And as scholars like James, they have, through their groundbreaking works, they have shown that in many cases, uh, there is this uh, international law, which is not perhaps truly international or International law can be an instrument of, if not subjugation, at least the domination of the global south in some ways. And the twill, which is a sort of loose, more or less informal network in last uh, 25 years or so, has produced a significant, not just number of scholarship, but I would say something which is substantial in terms of its impact and in terms of reach. Not all dwellers would subscribe to the same views on international law, but nonetheless, I think there are some overarching themes on which uh, the dwellers do agree, or we can find some strengths in their arguments. For example, I would, argue, I would think most dwellers would somehow relate their works to history. And their work is dedicated to make this international legal order a more egalitarian legal order. Their work is more reform oriented. And they try to give voices to those who are otherwise voiceless. With that brief introduction, dear audience, I thank you for your kind participation. And I once again thank Professor Gatti for his generous response to my invitation. I look forward to the talk uh, of this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Professor Gatti, um, whenever you're ready, please. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so you, you can hear me. So thank you uh, very much, uh, 
Professor Rizwan Islam uh, and uh, Mr. Sakwi Brahman for this kind invitation and introduction. I am delighted to be with you all today to share a few thoughts about third world approaches to international law. Uh, before doing so, uh, let me say a few preliminary thoughts uh, uh, about why this topic is very important to me, uh, especially as uh, Professor Islam uh, mentioned uh, to many third world scholars. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is that I'm really very impressed. I'm actually very super impressed by the international law scholarship by produ produced by Bangladeshi international lawyers. Uh, you know, so I don't want to embarrass you, uh, Professor Islam, you're one of them, uh, especially in international economic law. Uh, recently, uh, he convened uh, a very successful written symposium uh, on the Regional Economic Cooperation Partnership Agreement, the RISEP, uh, for a blog I'm involved with called Afronomics.org, and he was able to galvanize uh, the leading scholars in international economic law, showing truly that he is one of those. Um, in addition, uh, just a week ago, we, on that blog, Afronomicslaw.org, carried a week-long book review symposium of a book written by uh, Dr. Rumana Islam, uh, who is an associate professor at the Department of Law at the University of Dhaka. The book is entitled The Fair and Equitable Treatment Standard in International Investment Arbitration, Developing Countries in Context, was published by Springer in 2018. Um, in addition, uh, you may know that there is a pioneering volume edited by another Bangladeshi scholar, Professor Shahabuddin, Mohammed Shahabuddin, uh, of the University of Birmingham Law School. That book, which I encourage you if you don't already know about it and haven't seen it and haven't read it, Bangladesh and International Law. It is a 2021 volume. Um, as uh, Professor Shehabuddin uh, notes in, in the introduction to that important book, it is the first ever comprehensive study of international law issues, both classical and contemporary from Bangladesh perspectives. Uh, that book is contextualized within the global power political environment within which international law operates. It challenges the Eurocentrism that, Eurocentricism that characterizes the scholarship and practice of international law. It centers perspectives of global South countries and peoples uh, and quite importantly, as Professor Shahabuddin notes in the introduction to that book, it's written by a group of Bangladeshi international lawyers representing different generations. And I really like the assertion in the book that it represents Bangladesh's and the global South's international law stories of suffering, of solidarity, of resilience, of resistance and success. Um, Finally, as part of this very introductory remarks, uh, before I say uh, more about third world approaches to international law, I also want to mention another very important initiative in the Asian region that I admire very much. And, and this is the Teaching and Research in International Law in Asia Network, Trilla. The Teaching and Research in International Law in Asia uh, Network uh, that is uh, uh, been doing a lot of uh, uh, workshops in uh, various law schools around uh, the Asian region, um, uh, whose goal is uh, to bring together academics, particularly young academics, to meet and share their experiences and to network, uh, in addition to discuss the challenges of teaching and research these scholars face, uh, to evaluate the Asian experience in terms of global developments for their scholarship and their teaching, and to provide guidance on the writing and research of international law. In my view, uh, Trilla, like Twail, is a really good model for enhancing and deepening international law research and teaching that is centered on the priorities, needs, and interests of developing countries like Bangladesh and uh, my country, Kenya, which I'll say something brief about in a couple of minutes. Um, so I want to uh, begin by saying that this uh, network, the Third World Approaches to International Law Network, uh, was uh, uh, 
it's an old idea, as I'll say, in the sense that there have been many international lawyers from developing countries that have been working uh, on the themes that I'll talk about, three main themes, one of which has already been mentioned uh, by Professor Islam, uh, that's the history of international law. But also it has very humble beginnings in the sense that uh, when uh, uh, a few of us uh, about you know, 20, 25 years ago uh, came up with this acronym, Third World Approaches to International Law, we did not think that uh, you know, 20 years later that it would really become a galvanizing uh, uh, network uh, that now has, has many voices uh, all over the world. And so, you know, if you're a law student and you're interested in international law, uh, um, uh, lots of uh, things can happen down the way if you sort of are truly committed to your element. Um, so, uh, as I said, I want to say a few things about why, for me, uh, the work I do, uh, the practice of international law that I engage in, uh, is important. And I want to begin by saying, as as an elementary school and high school student growing up in Kenya many years ago, Kenya is on the Eastern seaboard of Africa. The history I got taught and tested on in high stakes national exams. I don't know if they have high stakes national exams in high school and elementary school in Bangladesh. They still have them in Kenya. Uh, I really was taught to learn some very important dates and some very important personalities. And then I would have to cram those dates and those personalities, especially in my history. And then I would have to reproduce those dates and those personalities in the national exams. Um, and it was very competitive, for example, to get to law school. So you'd have to be very good at uh, cramming all that stuff uh, to make it uh, to the professional schools. Um, I vividly remember my history uh, uh, learning how European missionaries and explorers discovered Mount Kenya, the highest mountain in Kenya, <clears throat> the source of the River Nile, uh, among other important geographical landmark features. Uh, those facts about those European explorers, uh, like uh, David Livingstone and others, and, and, and many others that I'll not mention, were really key to making sure that I passed my exams. This history of the discovery of Africa and how land was appropriated for white settlement uh, indicates uh, the European-centered uh, nature of the history that I was taught. The agency of African peoples was erased from this history. Now, of course, this history is based on several problematic assumptions, all inaccurate, but clearly an indication of who wrote this history that I was supposed to learn. First of, of course, it assumes that before these European missionaries and explorers saw these landmarks that no one else had seen them. Uh, they also assumed that no one lived on these territories until white people came from Europe to discover these African landmarks. Uh, these European explorers and merchants and uh, explorers it's assumed must have been so brilliant that they could find their way around Africa to places that nobody had ventured before. And voila, they, are, they discovered uh, these landmarks uh, that no one had seen before. Uh, another assumption is that Africa was there to be discovered. It was as George Willem Frederick Hegel had argued in his philosophy of history that Africa was an unconscious graphical entity lying beyond the day of self-conscious history enveloped in the dark mantle of the night. Uh, for Hegel, Africa was locked in the land of childhood. You do not have to be a Kenyan or an African to see the assumptions underlying this doctrine of discovery as it is called, according to which European explorers and missionaries discovered non vacant so-called vacant non-European land. Uh, of course, this was a self-serving doctrine to justify European colonial co conquests over non-European lands. Now, let me use an illustration that might be relevant uh, for Bangladesh. Uh, Raja uh, Devashish Roy, the titular Raja of the Chakam of the uh, of the Chakma Sako of indigenous community, and one of the indigenous communities there, was a member of the United Nations 
permanent forum on indigenous issues from 2014 to 2016. He told that commission in 1994, and I quote, the discovery doctrine had no legal standing. It was a racist exercise in legal gymnastics, which was dead. He told the permanent forum to examine the legacies of this doctrine, which he noted was unfortunately alive and kicking in national laws, in policies on land, forests, and natural resources, whether contrary to or in line with national constitution. He told the commission that most national constitutions declare Can you hear me? Yes, Professor. Yes. Okay. Uh, it looked like I went mute for one second. I was in, uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, that you could uh, still hear me. You're clear, so he sir. told he told uh, the commission that most national constitutions declared that the state belonged to citizens, including indigenous peoples. Uh, but indigenous peoples in most countries, he argued, remained on the margins of power lawmaking and policy. By default, lawmaking remained, he argued, an undemocratic process. The foregoing example illustrates one of the things that makes third world approaches to international law very distinctive as an approach to thinking about international law than any other approach to international law, whether you're talking about positivism or whatever other method you might think about. Another Bangladesh international lawyer and scholar, uh, Cynthia Farid, has argued that one of the objectives of a third world approach to international law is to uncover the subaltern voices, the voices you cannot hear. For example, in my example of those missionaries and explorers uh, and merchants who centered the history that I was taught. Uh, and the reason that uh, Cynthia Farid argues uh, that a major objective of Twill is to therefore uncover, to excavate these marginalized or unheard voices from the periphery. Projects like the teaching and research of international law in Asia, the Trilla uh, Network, uh, Afronomics Law, uh, the, third, the Third World Review, the, uh, uh, there's a, now a, a, a twelve review, um, and the International Economic Law Collective are examples of networks that are trying to counter the Eurocentric nature of international law uh, that uh, still pervades a lot of international law scholarship and the kinds of books that are often used in the teaching uh, of international law. So 12 scholarship, third world approaches to international law scholarship, uh, 12 scholarship has more than any other type of scholarship uh, uncovered and traced how colonial expansion was facilitated by Eurocentric international law under the guise of Eurocentricity, under the guise of universality. Uh, and the way it sought to incorporate non-European peoples in what was invariably a process of subordinating, colonizing and pillaging non-European peoples and their wealth. Twelve scholars have argued that international law arose in large part to facilitate the acquisition of non-European territories and to guarantee uh, rules of international law like those of international economic law, uh, uh, protect the commerce and commercial routes that brought raw materials from the non-European world to the European world. You know, so uh, uh, twelve scholars try to uncover those stories that are not often the stories that are told in international law. Anthony Angi's important book, Imperialism, Sovereignty, and the Making of International Law, uh, published in 2005, is the leading twill text revising mainstream international law history. Angi's book traces how sovereignty was used in the history of international law as a mechanism of exclusion of non-European society from the realm of sovereignty and power. This he argues was possible because at the center of this analytical framework is what he calls the dynamic of difference between civilized and uncivilized 
uh, peoples according to this international Eurocentric international law. So in Angie's work, he shows very persuasively how this dynamic of difference uh, that characterized uh, the, the non-European peoples as barbaric uh, uh, was a central question addressed by natural law and positivist jurists. And that this uh, dynamic of difference continues to date in many doctrines of international law. So Angie's work is really very important. Uh, and he sort of led a whole generation of third world international law scholarship to show how early international law publicists like uh, Victoria uh, justified the right of European states to hospitality and then to engage in war if the people they visited, like the Indians of North America, refused to uh, accept uh, to be hospitable uh, to uh, these Europeans when they arrived on their territory. And also to justify not just the conquest, but also the trade uh, that uh, uh, these European uh, uh, merchants and explorers and missionaries uh, came with uh, from, from Europe. So um, I would say, therefore, it's really important uh, in studying the history of international law uh, to trace uh the hallmarks of colonialism embedded within that history uh as many third world international law scholars have done and how the vestiges the remains of that history can still be seen not just within the league of nations mandate system or the trusteeship system of the united nations system or in many other ways within the Bretton woods institutions the world bank and imf and I'll not go into many details about that. Perhaps if there is time, we can talk about that in the question and answer session. So for Twellers, uh, therefore, uh, international legal history is not a linear progress history uh, in which order overcomes chaos or in which backwardness or the uncivilized nature of non-European peoples has to be overcome by adopting civilized, so certain hallmarks of civilization. Rather, many aspects of colonial Eurocentric international law continue to be embedded even today in post-colonial international law. So let me go to the second distinctive aspect. The first distinctive aspect of third world approaches to international law, I say it is history. Uh, the second is that, and is very related to this, the first is that third world approaches to international law provides a substantive critiques of both the politics and the scholarships of international law. For example, it is important to note that the almost total absence engagement with issues of race in international law scholarship. In fact, in the Bangladesh and international law volume edited by Mohammed Shahabuddin that I mentioned, he mentions the uh, League of Nations, uh, the, the proposal, excuse me, uh, by Japan, uh, known as the Japanese Racial Equality Proposal in 1919 at the League of Nations. And he notes, uh, Professor Shahabuddin notes, that even though the Japanese were promoting this racial equality proposal, that was really very important because the Japanese were facing uh, a lot of criticism in the United States because of Japanese immigration into the United States. Japan was not committed to racial equality in its relations with other parts of Asia. Uh, so a lot of work still remains to be done on this point uh, about the, the, the structuring nature of race in international law. Uh, this point about race reinforces this second twill insight that international law and international legal scholarship is a crucial field of struggle against domination and marginalization of non-European states and peoples and entities, but also minorities of color, as well as indigenous peoples who live in the settler countries of the global North. So for example, uh, the African-Americans, uh, the indigenous peoples of, of North America, Australia, uh, all those uh, settler countries uh, have many similarities with a lot of the indigenous rights entitlements uh, of the global south. And a lot of important twill work is being done to uncover those similarities 
and to make them more conspicuous than they have been. So a key feature therefore of Twill's decolonizing agenda is exploring the extent to which these marginalizations uh, are covered up by the liberatory goals uh, of international law, sovereign equality, self-determination, rights, development, and equalities. Twill scholars emphasize how these liberatory goals coexist alongside economic hierarchy and subordination between nations, and therefore carry forward within them the legacy of colonial conquest and European imperialism. A key insight, therefore, of Twill scholarship is that third world states and scholars have been actively involved in contesting and reshaping the multilateral order for many decades because of its limitations. Twill scholars question the representation of international law's capacity to do good through ideals such as humanitarianism, human rights, peace of determination, and so on and so forth. They trace how international law entrenches the interests of some over others, for example, the interests of capital over those of values such as human rights, uh, and even laying a groundwork you know, for uh, how, as I said on the first point, uh, European notions such as those of statehood are the ones that uh, we operate within uh, rather than anything else that existed before European conquest. For some, uh, for example, some of this scholarship shows how international legal regimes, such as those relating to trade, investment and development and human rights are projected as universal ideals and goals. Well, at times they are applied in ways that are partial and detrimental to the peoples of the third world and third world countries. Um, and so this is a really important theme. Uh, uh, you know, we can give, I can give many examples of this uh, and maybe we can talk about this in uh, the question and answer session, uh, particularly this idea of, about how things that are otherwise very laudatory, very important, like rights, like development, have a double face, that they can be both tools of liberation, uh, but they often embed within them very problematic histories. And sometimes that they are they're used in ways that are inconsistent with the interests of the most marginalized. Um, one of the best books that I know that does a great job of uncovering this problematic history, but also looking uh, at ways in which uh, international law can advance the interests of the marginalized communities, states uh, of the world is Mohammed Bejawis, an Algerian international lawyer, a book uh, published in 1979 called Towards a New International Economic Order, uh, which focuses on the need for international legal solutions to overcome economic difficulties of the then newly independent states uh, through the agenda uh, that these states had in the United Nations General Assembly, uh, uh, the, not just the new international economic order, but the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States and, and other initiatives. You know, this agenda of reforming international law, which is the third aspect of Twill scholarship, um, uh, as uh, Professor Islam noted, uh, is one that you can trace to even further back uh, beyond the second post Second World War period. Uh, in the work of Latin American jurists of international law, who in the 19th century uh, came up with doctrines of international law as a response to the system of capitulations that first world states had imposed on states in Latin America. So for example, the Calvo doctrine or the Drago doctrines, which asserted the sovereignty of Latin American states uh, in their relationships with creators from Europe and the United States are very good examples of these reform efforts of third world international lawyers and of third world states. Another important uh, international law scholar, uh, uh, Mr. Sonaraj, Professor Sonaraja uh, of the, um, he teaches at uh, the National University of Singapore has argued that third world scholars have long been concerned about how private power and private law 
underpin the structural inequalities between the first and the third world in international law. And a lot of his work falls in this sort of third element of, in, of, of 12 scholarship of how to reform and remake international law by exploring alternatives to the problematic legacy of colonialism in international law. So I want to, uh, <clears throat> as I come uh, to an end uh, in this lecture, emphasize <clears throat> that Twill is not simply a, an oppositional type of scholarship or a deconstructive type of scholarship of some people <clears throat> would argue. Rather, uh, <clears throat> it is a scholarship that also tries to propose alternative ways of thinking about the role of international law in the global uh, political economy. Uh, in ways that overcome the subordination of not just third world states, but of third world peoples, uh, even those peoples that might be subordinated within third world states, or like I said, the minorities within the global north. So um, from this perspective, um, therefore, uh, Twill occupies uh, almost sort of a double uh, track. On the one hand, sort of looking quite critically at the way in which international law tells stories that subordinate certain histories and that legitimize certain outcomes. While on the other hand, uh, and also by the way, challenging <clears throat> uh, the underlying premises, uh, for example, the Judeo-Christian ideals that seem to underlie a lot of uh, sort of the uh, ideas about international law. Well. At the same time, uh, figuring out ways of overcoming those inequalities that are embedded, that go back a long time ago, that are colonial and so on and so forth, uh, that go back a long way. So for example, how to reform uh, institutions like the United Nations Security Council, uh, where there's no representation of Africa or Latin America, for example, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the permanent five uh, of the Security Council. Uh, or how the voting structures of the Bretton Woods institutions uh, uh, exclude uh, the voices of the most marginalized countries in the world. Because there, as you know, in the voting structures of the Bretton Woods institutions, there's what they call weighted voting. You, your voice is as big as the number of shares that you have invested in that institution, which means that uh, a lot of uh, what happens in those institutions is determined not by the interests of the smaller countries that are most in need uh, of collective action at the global level, but by the countries uh, that historically have had a larger share of global wealth, some of which acquired uh, through processes uh, like colonization and slavery and the rest of them. Uh, and so these are the challenges that many international lawyers are fighting uh, to overcome and many third world states as well. So in conclusion, I wanna note that uh, third world approaches to international law is uh, an approach to international law that spans several decades and several continents uh, in, in the 19th and 20th and now in the 21st centuries. And in this talk, I've emphasized some thematic connections and some of the scholarly agendas uh, uh, across uh, these generations, across the continents, um, and across the many uh, uh, types of uh, themes that emerge. There are many that I haven't been able to speak about, uh, but what is really important in all of them is that they seek to displace the Eurocentric character of international law. Uh, this is a continuing task. Uh, it's a really difficult task made by the fact that many post-colonial states also have their own challenges. And I look forward to the discussion we're gonna have and I thank you very much for your attention today. And uh, again, the opportunity to be able to uh, talk with you about uh, my research. So back to you, uh, Professor Islam. Thank you very much, um, sir. Uh, we do have certain questions and um... Uh, I am of the belief that um, you, uh, everybody else here, uh, they're actually uh, waiting for you to actually answer them. 
Um, if you would permit, um, I would like to um, start one by one. Professor Gatti. Uh, Professor Gatti, uh, should I be asking the questions? Yeah, you can go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Professor Gatti, um, this is your first question. How would you distinguish the work of your generation of theatre from the first generation of theatre? Yeah, so this is, uh, um, this is, I guess, uh, I guess a trick question because uh, there's been a very big debate as to whether there's a first generation and a second generation. Uh, but I will, let me first say my understanding of what the debate has been, uh, because I am guilty of having uh, helped to entrench this distinction between first and second generation of international law scholarship among third world approaches to international law. So I, <clears throat> my own scholarship has argued that you can think of international law scholars from the third world as falling in two generations. One generation, and I would argue that the sort of Latin American jurists of the 19th century and early 20th century that uh, I mentioned towards the end of my talk, uh, like Calvo, you know, the Calvo doctrine, uh, and, and Drago, who is a foreign, min, uh, foreign affairs minister uh, in one of the countries in Latin America that got blockaded and wanted to figure out a way of overcoming the system of capitulations where creditors from Western nations justified using what they call the right of diplomatic protection or using war to enforce the rights of uh, creditors. Uh, this uh, early international law practitioners and scholars used international law as a neutral framework to respond to the inequalities of international law. Uh, they did not necessarily, like the second generation of international law scholars like Anton Yangi, probe into the colonial Eurocentric foundations of international law. So while both have the same agenda, I think that the uh, the second generation has been much more interested in tracing the Eurocentric foundations of the knowledge system that undergirds international law, very much along the lines of my story at the very beginning of the lecture about the history I was taught in high school about who discovered the highest mountain in Kenya, who discovered the source of the Nile, you know, that was simply repeating a Eurocentric history that is highly problematic. And I think that the second generation of scholars has said, you know, it, you could encounter sort of the Eurocentric foundations as the Latin American jurists did by proposing new rules to counter the colonial rules. That's very possible. In fact, that's what the, um, the third world states tried to do with the new international economic order and the Charter of economic rights and duties of states in the 1970s. And you know, that's what um, uh, that was all about. But I think uh, the second generation of scholars has been sort of much more aggressive in saying, we need to also understand the problematic historical legacy and the complicity of international law in the way it degraded non-European peoples. Uh, and that we should contest that history and uncover it and not assume that these rules are neutral, natural, and necessary. I think that's the best answer I can give. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, here is our second question. And this question comes from um, the chair of the Department of Law, uh, Professor Rizwan al -Islam. Would you agree that most of the contributions of TWAIL so far has been by third world scholars based in developed countries. In any case, how could scholars and practitioners based in the third world could, more, can, could have more contribution to the TWAIL movement? Yeah, um, again, I'm guilty of this. I, I live in uh, North America and therefore uh, this is uh, uh, um, a question directed to people like me. I think it's, it's a very fair point. You know, Dr. Islam makes a very fair point. Uh, that perhaps, I think the, the way I would uh, respond is by, is by saying that perhaps 
the work of scholars like myself and Anthony Angi, who operates between Singapore and uh, University of Utah here in the United States, is that we have we have had a platform that allows our work uh, to have more visibility, perhaps more than it should deserve. Um, but having said that, uh, I think that a lot of uh, the third world, third world approaches to international law work that I am familiar with also comes from uh, scholars of international law who are based in the third world or who most of their careers was based in the third world. So for example, if you think about the scholarship in Africa of a scholar known as Uo Umozarike, uh, although he went to school in the UK, he taught most of his life uh, in Nigeria. Uh, he, um, uh, he was uh, a member of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights among many other things. And I know of, of many African scholars uh, uh, in the past, uh, as well as at the moment, who have gone back uh, after studying abroad uh, and are making a difference. The best example in Asia, in my view, is Professor Bupinda Chimney. Uh, he's, um, you know, he, he's written some of the most important work in international law, whether at will or not. And he's been based in India all his life. Uh, so I do think that there are examples of, of people like, uh, you know, Bupinda Chimney. I, I can think of, of many others. Uh, I wrote recently, I gave recently uh, last year in June, uh, the Grotius Lecture, and I developed a very extensive bibliography of, of as much 12 scholarship as I could find. And I can tell you that a lot of that scholarship has been written by uh, by scholars who are based uh, like uh, Professor Islam in the third world. Uh, so I think, unfortunately, uh, we have had the microphone, you know, the megaphone, but uh, that is not to say that there is no, that is not to say that there is not, that, that there is no important work uh, that's being done uh, by third world scholars in, in the, in the non-Western world. And I personally, I'm very committed to amplifying and centering the work of uh, third world scholars who are working in the third world. And that is why today I intentionally uh, was mentioning Bangladeshi international scholars who I have interacted with and whose work I really admire because I think it's our joint responsibility to promote that work. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, Professor, we have another question. It's from Ms. Antara Tasni. Yeah. How would Thuyen scholars ensure that its own elite does not emerge while, which while criticizing the current international law regime works more towards stabilize, st stabilizing the Eurocentric status quo rather than providing an alternative to challenge it? Yeah, that's a really, really very, very other good question. Another very, very good question. And, uh, and you know, to answer that question, I will um, let me try to answer it the best way I can about how I think about this challenge of the, can, can the master's tools be destroyed using the tools of the master? You know, sort of, that's sort of a, 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 another way of rephrasing that question. And my response is that every effort to overcome the problematic legacies of international law using rules of international law have both the danger of overcoming those problems, but also of entrenching them. So there's not going to be a high noon where we overcome the problematic legacy of international law, where we say, that we have been able to erase the Eurocentric legacy of international law. I am here speaking to you in English, which is imposed on the country where I grew up because it was a British colony. The books that I used to read international law were all written by British international law scholars. 
it's going to be very difficult to overcome that legacy. A friend of mine became the dean. Uh, her name is Professor Sylvia Kangara. She became the dean of a law school in Nairobi that was an indigenous, it, uh, that was built with indigenous capital. You know, this was not a school connected in any way to Western capital. It was the money was uh, domestic entrepreneurs who had established an education system at the lower level, at the secondary school level, at the primary school or elementary school level, and now wanted to invest in building a university that was uh, that also reflected the success that they had had with growing a homegrown educational system. The challenge was when she established this law school, she needed a library. And Dean Sylvia Kangara had to go to the UK to spend millions of pounds to buy books because there were no books available in, um, uh, in Kenya, unfortunately. Uh, that would satisfy the educational accrediting authorities that this university, uh, this law school that she was putting up uh, could educate the students. So that's a very good example as this question reflects of how you restabilize, even when you're trying to build, you restabilize the problematic international law uh, legacy. Uh, now, the way that uh, she and others, uh, including myself, and I'm, I'm sure, many of the people I've mentioned, including in Bangladesh, are trying to overcome this, is to try to produce scholarship that, first of all, is not, is not behind a paywall. Uh, very, very important to establish scholarship that's not behind a paywall. Uh, to also write scholarship that centers <coughs> the experience of developing countries. Uh, very, very important. <coughs> and third, to network with other scholars around the world both in developing countries, but also in first world countries. So people like me uh, who do this for a living uh, so that jointly we can counter uh, the Eurocentricity. So we are not using, you know, all these very expensive case books of international law that uh, we used to teach here in the West that barely, if at all, ever mention any non-European scholars or any non-European perspectives or any of the critical perspectives uh, on third world approaches to international law. Uh, but the fact that we are having this type of a discussion and that you are inviting me is part of that process. It's gonna be a very long process. Colonial rule in Africa was over two centuries. It's not gonna be overcome by one or two lectures by me or one or two articles. It's gonna require a sustained systematic effort uh, uh, into the future. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, Professor, we have another question. Um, considering uh, the new new generation, would you say that this the, the trail is now a part of the mainstream method of studying and researching international law? <laughs> I wouldn't say that it's the mainstream. Um, I, I teach in North America, and uh, and uh, well, I have had. Uh, I've been very lucky to uh, to be, for example, on the board of the American Journal of International Law. Uh, this is not by any stretch uh, the mainstream view of uh, international law in North America. I, and I can say that perhaps that's the case uh, in, in places like Europe uh, and elsewhere. Uh, I fight very hard uh, as a scholar, not to be an adornment that uh, in all the places that I sit, whether it's on the board of editors of the American Journal of International Law or other places in international law, or when I get invited to speak or when I write my scholarship, I make it very clear that I have a very distinctive approach uh, and that I don't want to be an adornment as Professor Anthony Angi says, to ratify the dominant approaches to international law uh, the favored approaches uh, of international law. So uh, while I think third world approaches to international law scholars have done extremely well in galvanizing the voice of third world approaches to international law, it is a marginalized and a marginal approach to international law within the mainstream. And I have argued uh, every forum I get 
and every opportunity I get, that the mainstream has to engage with these critical approaches and not run away from them. In all in my practice, you know, when I have the opportunity to practice international law, that is what I do as well. And there are therefore, you know, uh, uh, many opportunities for us uh, who sort of do this kind of work. Uh, to continue this work in a sustained fashion in many places, you know, in the UN, uh, in, in international organizations that are regional or sub-regional, in the classrooms, in the writing, to participate in efforts like the TRILA, the Teaching, teaching and Researching International Law in Asia uh, uh, Networks. Uh, that's the only way to make these thing, things much more visible and to be part of the mainstream. But like I said, in the in response to the previous question, the mainstream has been going on for centuries. It's not going to be undone uh, um, in 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 um, in, uh, in a decade or two or even three. Thank you, Professor. Um, we have a question from Lionel Ako. Um, he's from the United Kingdom. To what extent, if any, does Twail underlook? The responsibilities of the third world leaders to their own institutional predicaments. Yeah, so this is a really important question, and uh, and uh, uh, I I I wrote my doctoral thesis uh, on this question of good governance uh, more than two decades ago, and I was really very interested uh, in the the way in which um, Western governments and Western institutions like the Bretton Woods institutions imposed uh, their model of development, uh, especially neoliberal economic development on countries uh, like Kenya. And a very central part of my thesis and, and a lot of the work that I do, I, I do a lot of work on constitutionalism, on human rights. You know, I have written a whole book about um, uh, the contested empowerment of Kenya's judiciary, uh, examining the pitfalls of post-colonial leadership uh, in Kenya and in Africa uh, in terms of the governance failures, in terms of their lack of taking responsibility for uh, the challenges uh, of post-colonial statehood. And uh, this, you know, currently, you know, I just joined Twitter the other day. Um, the, you know, the, the, the tweet that I have pinned on my handle is about the UK-Kenya free trade agreement, e economic partnership agreement, uh, which the Kenyan government uh, basically is giving uh, the UK and UK multinationals a uh, 25-year tax holiday. And it's really infuriating uh, to see those types of deals uh, that uh, African governments uh, continue to give uh, Western uh, countries. So if you look at my work on international trade law or my work on you know, human rights or constitutionalism uh, or the work of many twillers that I'm, I'm familiar with, you know, whether it's a, a whole series of twillers that are now UN special rapporteurs, uh, um, the, right, the rapporteur, the UN rapporteur on the right to food, um, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Michael Fakri, uh, the UN uh, um, special rapporteur on racism and xenophobia, uh, um, uh, uh, who, uh, whose uh, parents uh, grew up in, in, in Africa. All of us have really been concerned about the responsibility of post-colonial states uh, for what they are doing uh, internally. Uh, and, and so this is something that I think you will find, you know, 12 scholars that are just interested in uh, the West versus the rest. They are interested in, you know, what's happening within uh, sort of the global South as well. Thank you, Professor. Um, one more question. Do you see that the work of Twillers is having any impact on the law and policy making in the global south? That's a very good question. What, what I, I would love to hear what the questioner thinks. And I think, you know, so I've 
Um, this is a really very good question. A really, really, really very good question. And you know, um, this is this session is not about my work, but this is exactly what I've been thinking about. My latest book is exactly on that question. You know, the performers of Africa's international courts using litigation for political, legal, and social change. I've been tracking the work of really interesting uh, uh, practitioners of international law. They don't label themselves twillers, but they're really twillers. You know, think about, you know, a very good friend of mine called Don Dare, uh, uh, you know, a Kenyan international lawyer who is the chief executive officer of uh, the Pan-African Lawyers Union and the litigation uh, that inspired this book, you know, which is about, you know, how opposition political parties are, um, um, are sort of going around governments that are highly repressive at home and that uh, are highly irresponsive, not responsive to the demands of opening up political space in their domestic space and they go to international courts. So this, although these international courts were established for, for trade, you know, sort of resolving trade disputes, um, international lawyers in Africa have transformed them into human rights courts to create an additional avenue of challenging the repressive nature of governance in these countries. So if you look at the profile of any scholar, you see like me, uh, public international law, domestic law, regional law, and that the commitments that we are trying to articulate um, is to amplify the voices of those practitioners and scholars who, like my friend Donde and many others in Africa, are pushing the boundaries of international law. And so there are networks that we have as two scholars, just like in earlier generations of uh, 12 scholars around the world that are pushing the boundaries in ways that are really highly invisible. If all you read are the 12 articles we write, uh, uh, but not also this other important work that uh, is being done in the United Nations, uh, sort of being covered in this additional scholarship. Now, this is not to say that these things are making a difference in the sense of tomorrow there will be a high noon and all these things are gonna end. Rather is to say, uh, the change is difficult. It happens in complex ways. Sometimes you make progress today, but tomorrow a more repressive regime comes in and pushes back quite hard and the struggle continues. I mean, think about all the important work also done by lots of uh, tour scholars in the space of international cr uh, criminal law, especially in Africa. You know, uh, I cover many of those types of uh, issues in uh, my Grotius lecture. Uh, which is available somewhere online. You can watch and sort of I uh, sort of talk about all these important developments uh, made by uh, lawyers from the third world in all these spaces that that I think can be a really important inspiration for younger international law scholars or practitioners who are looking to do work in this area. Thank you very much, Professor. Um... For the audience, um, we're afraid we have to take just one more question uh, because of time constraints. Professor, this is your last question. Do you see a resurgence of the Calvo doctrine in some parts of the world? Well, I, you know, so this is a question that, uh, so the Calvo doctrine is the idea that if a foreign investor comes to Bangladesh, foreign investor must be governed by Bangladeshi law and the disputes must be governed by uh, uh, must be decided by Bangladeshi courts. That's basically what the Calvo Doctrine, those are the two most important ideas. It's basically national treatment. What's good for a Bangladeshi investor is good for a foreign investor and vice versa. It's equality, you know, no have, not having international law create special rights for foreign investors that are not accessible to Bangladeshi investors. You not have a special type of dispute settlement, like investor state dispute settlement arbitration, in which, uh, for which Bangladeshi investors don't have a right uh, to have access to. That's the basic idea. Now, if that's the basic idea, 
the U.S. has the Calvo Doctrine. Since at least uh, 2002, under the Trade Act of 2002, the U.S. Congress passed a law that says the principle known as no greater than rights principle, meaning if you come to the United States as a Bangladeshi investor, you have no greater rights than an American investor in the United States, which means you cannot use ISDS, you cannot use investor state dispute settlement to overturn environmental laws made in the state of Illinois where I live or in the state of New York or wherever. That's the Calvo Doctrine. That's the Calvo Doctrine. The current president of the United States President Biden opposes investor state dispute settlement in investment treaties. That's the Calvo doctrine. So the final thing I'm going to say, there's, there's a story that is being told in international investment law that there's a resurgence of nationalism, of resource nationalism. Let me just be very plain. That is complete utter nonsense. There is nothing like that. That is the narrative of first world states and especially of lawyers who support these investors, suggesting that third world states are drunk with economic nationalism, very much the same way they argued against the new international economic order in the 1970s, much the same way they argued in uh, opposition to the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States. It's a story that completely decontextualizes the history of international law, the colonial nature of many of the concessions that Western countries got. And so I've been very clear in my own work that this is complete, this story about the rise of economic nationalism is complete utter nonsense. I'm not even referring to the American first idea. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that there's a long history within which we must see these ideas. And we must be suspicious of ideas uh, that, I'm not even talking about permanent sovereignty of natural resources. Um, I'm not even talking about the constitutions of many third world countries, and I'm sure Bangladesh uh, is one of them, uh, where the resources of Bangladesh are supposed to be used for the sole use of the people of Bangladesh and not for other people. So the final thing I'm going to say is, is something connected to the first point, one, uh, in response to one of the earlier questions, which is to say, <clears throat> unfortunately, many elites in the third world, including in my own country, Kenya, like I gave you the example of the UK, Kenya Economic Partnership Agreement, are far too willing to sign concessions that are and contracts and deals that are highly beneficial to a very narrow class of domestic elites. It's a problem in many parts of the developing world. Professor Bupinda Chimney calls this the transnational capitalist class. And we must we, the third world people, we must be able to call these elites for what they are. Uh, they are helping the project of Western capital. And therefore they are part of that Western capital and again, and serving against the interests of the people of the third world. The story about economic nationalism is a story being, is a very partial story being written on the other side. Um, and one that should be rejected for what it is, complete utter nonsense. I'm sorry to use those words, but that's what it is. So thank you very much. Professor Gatti, um, thank you very much. Uh, to the audience, thank you very much. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have actually had you, uh, Professor Gatti, and we do look forward to inviting you even more. Um, for the audience, I would like to bring to your notice that uh, we will have the YouTube um, video and uh, we, we will be uploading this particular um, lecture um, in our YouTube channel. So you are requested to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you do have uh, in your chat boxes uh, the concerned link. Uh, Professor Gatti, um, thank you again. And uh, if there's anything uh, you'd want to say to the audience, uh, final words, uh, and then we will be ending the session.
Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here and being very patient and for your excellent questions. I apologize if I've not been able to answer them to your satisfaction. And I thank uh, you, uh, uh, Mr. Ramban and uh, Professor Islam, uh, very much for inviting me. I'm really humbled to have been part of this conversation with all of you. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Good night. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Bye.